Dear Game Freak, Hi, it's me, Austin, your worst nightmare. Don't you remember me? You should. I'm the one responsible for bursting your Pokeball conspiracy wide open. Yeah, I saw your press release by your paid lackeys at Kotaku saying that Pokeballs are just fluffy pleasure domes where Pokemon get jerked off by Jigglypuffs all day, but I know better. I know the truth, I did the math, and I know what you're hiding. But today is not about that. Today, though, is about you. And honestly, knowing that your Pokeballs are quantum murder meat grinders hasn't come even remotely close to diminishing your luster in my eyes. I've been completely completely hooked on your games ever since you released Pokemon Red and Blue for the regular Game Boy in 1996. What was once just a tiny plastic cartridge sporting 151 cute little monsters that you could force to fight for your amusement has exploded into the second largest video game media franchise in history, second only to Mario, because apparently Nintendo owns literally everything. Now we've got over 800 of these little pieces of crap to keep track of, and Christ, it is making me feel old! Last month, you unleashed Pokemon Sun and Moon into the universe, and of course, like every other Pokemon fan in the world, I wanted to play it. So, I grabbed the son of a bitch as soon as it dropped! Ha! Wrong! <laughs> I've been locked out of new titles from the Pokemon franchise for years! I think I have a regular DS laying around somewhere and a copy of Heart Gold, but the fact of the matter is, ever since I introduced more vegetables and prune juice into my diet, I don't spend enough time on the John to justify buying a new handheld. But that doesn't matter. What was good and fun about the original Red and Blue has been preserved through the ages. Capture mystical monsters in a coconut, force them to commit mass murder in order to gain levels, rock, paper, scissors your way through the world, humiliating other dogfighters, and eventually, after leaving a trail of Rattata corpses behind you a mile long, your Pokemon will evolve from an adorable baby with cute little cheeks into a horrifying Goliath that has replaced all of its memories of cuddles with the desire to rend the flesh off the face of anything that stands in your way! Fun for the whole family! All that's changed is more creative recruits to the roster and shinier animation Strangely, they decided to keep the 56k modem Pokemon noises through the years for reasons that are beyond me. Anyway, instead of crying about my inability to play Sun and Moon, I booted up a copy of the objectively superior version of the original Pokemon, Pokemon Red. And you know, Game Freak, it was just after leaving Viridian Forest as I was walking in circles in Route 2, killing Rattatas and Pidgeys by the barrel full so I could get my Charmander a high enough level so I could shame Brock by pissing all over his face with a Fire-type Pokemon. I reached level 16, my Charmander evolved into a Charmeleon, and it hit me! Pokemon Evolution? makes no goddamn sense. Now, I know what you're thinking. Yes, Austin, I know, you're on the Game Theorists. You know, where Game Theory is. They covered Pokemon Evolution a hell of a lot already, especially pointing out that Pokemon Evolution actually resembles Metamorphosis more than actual bona fide evolution. To which I say, <laughs> my sweet summer child, you have no idea. You don't know what I know. But when I tell you, <laughs> when I tell you, then you'll finally understand the truth and you will realize that there's no place to hide from the terror. Yes, Matt Pat was right in his video from 2011 that I recommend you definitely go watch now because holy shit, it is so adorable, baby Matt! Oh my heart, look at that! Four to three ratio, chunky as hell animations, aww. Anyway, the process of Pokemon evolution, just like Digimon evolution, resembles more closely the biological process of metamorphosis than it does actual evolution. Evolution is a lengthy process wherein biologically advantageous traits are passed down through generations and exaggerated until eventually a species no longer resembles where it started. Metamorphosis, by contrast, is just a normal part of an animal's life cycle, where it moves from stage to stage stage fulfilling new roles in the ecosystem. Like a caterpillar that gives up eating metric butt tons of food to become a butterfly so it can book a one-way ticket to Bone City. Or a tadpole that gives up eating a metric butt tons of food to become a frog so it can book a one-way ticket to Bone City. You're living in city. Sensing a theme here? 
Me too, Mother Nature, you filthy, filthy beast. Anyway, this is what Pokemon do. They aren't spending thousands of years slowly shaving off inadequate traits and slapping on new ones. They're undergoing sudden, drastic changes to their anatomy in order to accomplish bigger and better things. The jury's still out on tickets to Bone City, but I'm guessing that has something to do with the ESRB ratings more than anything else. Nobody really wants to see that. So, what? Pokemon undergo metamorphosis. What's the big deal? Well, I'll tell you the big deal, because while this may be true, the poke process of poke metamorphosis is, at its heart, the key to the entire puzzle. And it's what makes the Pokemon universe truly, utterly, mortifyingly, uh, mortifying. Sorry. I have a newborn. Sometimes the words just come out the way they come out. Where was I? All right, metamorphosis. There's a bit of a problem with this Pokemon evolution equals metamorphosis theory, though. True, in almost every conceivable way it is, an organism moving from one stage to another, advancing along a path toward maturity and new biological roles. However, there is one key factor that makes all the difference in the world, time. You see, Pokemon evolution happens nearly instantly. Unlike metamorphosis, which actually takes days, weeks, or even months to be fully realized. Metamorphosis requires a huge, huge investment of energy. I mean, look at how goddamn fat this caterpillar is and how freaking tiny the butterfly it turns into is by comparison. Well, what does this have to do with Pokemon? In order to understand that, we're gonna have to talk about conservation of mass. Put simply, conservation of mass means you can't get something from nothing, and you can't turn something into nothing. If you take our whole wide universe and accept that inside this thing we call everything, there's a set amount of stuff. You can't get more, you can't get less. And inside this thing called everything, if you want to make something bigger, you gotta take stuff from something else. If you wanna make something smaller, you gotta put that mass somewhere. It's why teenagers have unstoppably voracious appetites. They're growing at a rate unprecedented unprecedented in their lives and therefore need more stuff to make their bodies into more stuff. And it's why caterpillars get so goddamn fat. They've got an absurd amount of work ahead of them, literally melting their bodies into a caterpillar soup, a sentence I really wish I hadn't read at 4.30 a.m. and rebuilding it into a thing that can fly and bone every other butterfly in the vicinity. Pokemon metamorphize in seconds and almost always get larger than they were before, which means the energy and materials other animals would gather over days Pokemon are sucking up in mere moments. This instantaneous, huge requirement of energy and stuff cannot, according to every law of physics we know of, be circumvented. All Pokemon are different, but in order to understand the terrifying implications of this process, we're gonna look at one of my favorite Pokemon of all time, Magikarp. Magikarp is amazing because it goes from being easily the most useless piece of garbage in the entire game to being a freaking dragon with the flick of a switch. And I have to admit, when I was a little kid, I foolishly paid the con man at the entrance to Mount Moon 500 bucks to get this totally useless trash Pokemon. Damn it! And that bastard offers no return! Swindler! If you're patient though, and you're able to raise this Magikarp to level 20, it turns into a freaking Gyarados, a Pokemon badass enough to chew its way through the Elite Four if so inclined. Magikarp is based on, you know, Carp, the garbage rat of the fish world. Weighing in at a respectable 10 kilograms, upon evolving this piece of rejected sushi grows to an immense 235 kilogram dragon. Over 500 freaking pounds! That's a mass increase of over 2,000%. In order to figure out what this means in real world terms, we're gonna have to build a working model of what the heck a Magikarp, and by extension, a Gyarados is made out of. Taking the real world rat fish carp as our substitute, since it's the closest thing in real life to an actual Magikarp, we can actually figure this out. And after combing through no less than six different academic papers published over the past 60 years, I finally have all the answers. And the answers are god damned terrifying. I'm gonna go through this really quickly because this is complicated, boring, and I have a tendency to talk too much, and I really, really, really want to keep this under 20 minutes, so here we go. <gasps> 
Piecing together chemical analysis that have been run over the common carp for decades, we can surmise that on average, the common carp, and by extension of magic carp, is comprised of approximately 78.15% water, 6.85% tissues, 5% blood, and trace minerals, and 10% skeleton. For the sake of simplicity, we're gonna presume that a fully grown Gyarados is comprised of the same ratio, the same materials. Unless you know of a real life river dragon I could compare to, but no, not that one, that's a cartoon! Starting with the easiest, water. Water is comprised of two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom, and is easily one of the simplest molecules we'll find inside our little magical beast. Next, the skeleton, which is mostly calcium hydroxyapatite, an incredibly complex complex molecule comprised of 10 calcium atoms, 24 phosphorus atoms, 26 oxygen atoms, and 2 hydrogen atoms. Believe it or not, that was the easy part. Now the tough stuff. <gasps> I'm gonna do blood and trace elements next because believe it or not, this is actually the next least terrible aspect. Carp are comprised of dozens of different compounds, some organic and some inorganic. The difference between inorganic and organic molecules is honestly pretty arbitrary. An inorganic one is just stuff that's already in the universe. Water, oxygen, and iron. Organic compounds are essentially these very same inorganic elements and atoms rearranged to form complex structures designed for complex roles in the bodies of living things. We just call them vitamins. Carp are comprised of primarily nitrogen, calcium, magnesium, sodium, potassium, phosphorus, sulfur, iron, manganese, vitamin A, carotene, vitamin C, nicotinic acid, riboflavin, and pentathenic acid, with nicotinic acid, vitamin C, nitrogen, and sodium making up the largest percentages of trace compounds and parts per million, adding a whole new mess of stuff we need to make our fish. But this, as bad as it looks, isn't even remotely close to the worst part. <sighs> The most complex series of compounds is nested in this deviously small little section, the 6.85% of body tissue. Specifically, these body tissues are split into two broad categories, proteins, or amino acids, and lipids, aka fats. Amino acids are, simply speaking, meat, and there are over 18 of them in our magic carp. Alanine, arginine, aspartic acid, cysteine, glutamine, glycine, histidine, isoleucine, leucine, lysine, methionine, phenylalanine, proline, serine, threonine, tryptophan, tryptophan, tyrosine, and valine. These amino acids are just differently arranged carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, and oxygen, and sometimes sulfur. Thankfully, there's only 15 lipids in carp, and they're just carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Meristic mirror Stoliac, palmitic, palmitoleic, stearic, oleic, linoleic, gamma linoleic, alpha linoleic, icosenioic, arachidonic, icosapatinoic, and docosapatinoic, and this one that's impossible to say. <sighs> Taking all these atoms and compounds and modifying them by their requisite percentages, we get a really close approximation of exactly how much of what stuff is needed to take a little itty bitty Magikarp and turn it into a behemothic Gyarados. Remember, something doesn't come from nothing. Nothing comes from nothing. We see that the biggest draw of materials is gonna be oxygen and hydrogen, which makes sense. At 78% water and with almost every single compound in the body being made from some combination of oxygen and hydrogen, it makes sense that together they make up 58% of the required atoms by mole. Next is phosphorus with a really steep drop off into calcium and carbon, and the rest really aren't worth talking about. There's only one way that a tiny 10 kilogram Magikarp can explode into a 235 kilogram Gyarados in mere moments by gobbling up over two hundred kilograms of garbage in the near vicinity. I'm talking about dirt, atmosphere, grass, trees, and buildings. Most of the things that are on this list are in our world in abundance. Carbon, sulfur, calcium, potassium, sodium, magnesium, iron, and manganese are all in dirt alone. The real problem comes from hydrogen and oxygen, which unfortunately make up most of our colossal Pokemon here. But Austin, you may be saying, water is everywhere, so is oxygen. It's in the atmosphere. It's what we breathe. You're not totally wrong, but the truth of the matter is that the air we breathe is mostly nitrogen. Less than a quarter of it is oxygen, and at sea level, there's only a quarter of a kilogram of oxygen per cubic meter, meaning that in order to get enough oxygen to build all those molecules, you're looking at our Gyarados sucking in all the available oxygen within a radius of 6.5 meters in a matter of seconds. And hydrogen? Things look incredibly dour. You see, you may think, oh, it's no big deal. There's water vapor. That'll take care of it. Yeah. Yeah, even on the most humid days, you're looking at 200 picograms of hydrogen per cubic kilometer. That means in order to get enough hydrogen to build this freaking dragon in mere moments, this Magikarp is gonna have to pull hydrogen from every available nearby source. And nearby is relative. Any hydrogen source within a 223 billion kilometer radius is fair game. And since there's very, very little hydrogen in open air, that means you better hope to Christ that there's a barrel of water between you and that Magikarp when it decides to poke evolve, or guess what? You're 
the most water-rich source available, and that Pokemon is gonna squeeze you dry like a sponge. And Gyarados is just an extreme example. Any Pokemon undergoing an extreme growth spurt in fractions of a second would be like a goddamned hand grenade going off as it immediately sucks in all available nutrients and elements in the vicinity, bursting pipes in local buildings to get at their water, killing other Pokemon in the area as it robs them of their vital vitamins and minerals, bursting eardrums from the massive pressure differentials formed by huge volumes of the local atmosphere immediately collapsing, blasting holes in the ground six meters deep, and sending all rejected elements flying out in all directions at high fractions of the speed of light, ionizing nearby atoms and sending gamma radiation and flying debris into anyone foolish enough to not hit that B button to cancel the evolution as quickly as possible. The world of Pokemon should look less like a beautiful rural Japanese landscape and more like the post-apocalyptic hellscape of Fallout, full of irradiated craters, nutrient-thirsty monsters, and idiot humans who weren't smart enough to murder every Pokemon in sight with lead pipes after the first one exploded into its next form. Forget dogfighting analogies and forget quantum murder from Pokeballs, Pokemon themselves are black holes of voracious destruction, ticking time bombs just sitting there looking adorable to keep you off guard just long enough for them to turn into implosive, tiny nuclear bombs before emerging as something stronger, meaner, and altogether more terrifying. Jesus Christ, Game Freak, you scare the ever-loving crap out of me. Sincerely, Austin. P.S. Hey, don't know who I am? I'm Austin! I just joined the Game Theorist! Some of you may know me and my series from the channel ShoddyCast. Do you want more of this sort of thing? Well then, you know, subscribe to the Game Theorist if you haven't yet. Oh, and you can go over to ShoddyCast right now. I have a whole nother science episode going up today! And dozens of other topics I've already covered! Do you have any questions about video game SCIENCE that you want answered? Some things that make no goddamn sense to you? Ask me in the comments section below and maybe I'll get to it! Or you know, shoot them to me on Twitter at ARHorrigan.